Barbell deadlifts, barbell squats, overhead press, lat pull down, chest press. And when you're ready to stop, repeat. That's how we climb Olympia. When you push that extra rep, when you pull another set, when you lift that one last rep, you will climb the mountain and no one will forget. Bring on the build with the NASM Physique and Bodybuilding Coach Program. You're listening to the NASM CPT Podcast with Rick Ritchie, winner of the Share Care Emmy Award for Social Storytelling and the official podcast of the National Academy of Sports Medicine. Hey, y'all, and welcome to the NASM CPT Podcast. My name is Rick Ritchie, and today we're going to talk about deadlifts. I was reviewing, listen, there are a lot of people who are interested in deadlifts. People love deadlifts. It's almost like, do you squat or do you deadlift? And there's an argument, squatting or deadlifting. But deadlifting is definitely a main lift that we see and that we hear about and we talk about and that we as fitness professionals do, that we coach, that we teach, and that we provide variants on. So I was doing a little research into some deadlifts and yo, check out what I found, an incredible systematic review by Martin Fuentes, Olivia Lorenzano, and Mayer in 2020. And it is an electromyographic activity when it comes to deadlifts and deadlift variants. So we're going to talk about this study that I found, and we're going to compare different types of deadlifts to each other and what muscles they work when it comes to surface EMGs and, and how they activate the muscles. So I found this really interesting. So let me just talk through the research study a little bit. And when it came to the study, this was the inclusion criteria. It was either a cross-sectional research design, study design, or it was a longitudinal study design. So that's number one. B, the evaluation of neuromuscular activation during deadlift exercise or deadlift variants. Three, it included healthy and trained participants. They didn't have any injuries for at least six months before they went into the measurements. And D, analyzation took place with either a surface EMG, muscle activation, or muscular activity with surface electromyography with those devices. So the surface ones are the ones that just, just go on top. So they're not plugging into the muscle to, to get the EMG. So Here's kind of the breakdown of the study. The most studied muscle was the biceps femoris. The biceps femoris, the lateral muscle in the hamstring group, that one was the most studied. Surprisingly, maybe a little more than the next one, which is the gluteus maximus. Now, it's not surprising necessarily when you look at the variants that are involved, but the glute max. So biceps, uh, there were 19 studies that were totaled in here. So 13 out of the 19 looked at the biceps fem. 10 out of 19 glute max, 8 out of 19 the vastus lateralis, the, uh, I think another 8 or 9, the erector spinae, and then the semimembranosis, sorry, the semitendinosis and rectus fem, the semimembranosis was not involved in any of the studies, 5 out of 10, and then the vastus medialis, external obliques, and medial gastrocnemius were studied in 3 of the 19, and I was surprised there were that many of uh, medial gastroc and oblique studied in a deadlift variation. But all in all, we got 19 studies that were included in this. So let's go into it. Here's the most researched deadlift variants, the conventional barbell deadlift. All right, that had 10 out of the 19 studies. Then the next was the stiff leg deadlift, six out of 19. And then the unilateral stiff leg deadlift, Romanian deadlift, and hex bar deadlift. All of those had two out of the 19 studies. So look, I know what you're thinking too. So there, there's some similarities and there are some differences. So it's a regular deadlift, you're holding, usually you'll see a bar in front of you with a barbell deadlift, a traditional, and it looks more like a squat than, uh, than anything else really. I mean, it's a deadlift, but the weight is loaded in front of you as opposed to 
a stiff leg deadlift where the legs, the knees are locked out. And a Romanian deadlift is when the knees have a slight bend, but it's still primarily a hinge pattern that's going on at the hip. All right. So let's talk a little bit more about what we found in the study. And then we're going to compare deadlift variations. And then we're going to do comparison between deadlifts and some other exercises. So um, here's the thing. When you do EMGs, <clears throat> all studies will look at EMGs in the concentric, but they don't always look at EMGs in the eccentric. And uh, I assume that, especially for heavier lifts, the lifters allow the weight to lower with less focus than trying to decelerate it. So as we know, like, especially for a deadlift, and a lot of times it might be done on platforms. So you lift up and you just kind of almost drop down with a little bit of deceleration. Now, none of these studies, or at least this study, did not discuss what that was, but only a few studies that were used here actually did the eccentric as a metric. And we know that there's some great benefits from eccentric training and adding eccentrics into your workout. They just weren't measured uh, in general with the EMGs. Now, let's get into comparing some deadlift variations. The first deadlift variation, one, and this one was not even studied. It was just uh, assumed that there would be a correlation there. So, and that is, and here's a quote from the study. The good morning exercise appears to be an appropriate substitute to the Romanian deadlift when it is preferable to place the load on the back instead of lifting it from the floor. The good morning provokes a similar muscular pattern of activation as the RDL, but it shows more muscular activation for the semi tendinosis and less muscle activation for the biceps femoris than the RDL. I found that really interesting. The good mornings work the medial hamstrings a little bit more than the, uh, the lateral hamstring, the biceps fem, and the RDL works the biceps fem a little bit more than the semis. So uh, that, was, that was pretty interesting. Here's the next one. Nijem et al. 2016 compared the deadlift versus deadlift with chains. And there was a significant difference for the gluteus maximus muscle, uh, which was a greater muscle activation during the deadlift than the deadlift with chains. And that makes sense because, <clears throat> excuse me, as you go deeper into a deadlift in those end ranges of motion, the, the chains get lighter. And as you come more upright, because you're lifting the chains and you're fighting against more weight and gravity as you lift more and more of the chain, it gets heavier as you lift. But the, the muscles seem to be very activated in a lengthened position. So if you have a uniform weight and it's heavier at the bottom position, then it seems that that makes sense that you would get more muscle activation, greater muscle activation in the deadlift versus a deadlift with chains. So here's the next one. Muscular activation presented during elastic bands on a stiff leg deadlift was lower than elicited during a stiff leg deadlift with free weights. Same issue I think applies here where the band is much lighter as you lower yourself down and as you stand up, the band gets stretched and it gets heavier and heavier. So it does make sense that the, the free weights on a stiff leg deadlift would, would incorporate more muscle activation throughout the range of motion because it is heavier in the lengthened position. All right. There were also significant differences in the glute max, biceps femoris, and the semitendinosis when it came to, to the stiff leg deadlift with, um, with weights, and that was that the glute max, biceps fem, and semitendinosis muscles were activated more with the free weights versus the band weights. Okay. They also did comparison of the deadlift and deadlift variants to other exercises, so one of the research studies was McCurry et al. reported significantly greater muscle activation for the gluteus maximus and the hamstring muscles during a modified single leg squat when compared to a back squat and a stiff leg deadlift. So there was more glute and hamstring activation in a modified single leg squat. How is it modified, you ask? I don't know. I don't know. I 
don't know. It doesn't, it doesn't say. It just says modified single leg squat. However, that modification and that modification might have been a single leg squat to a bench that modificate or a box that modification may have been having your um, your toe on the ground with the other foot, the elevated foot, just to help maintain balance. We don't really know what the modifications were, but we do know that that single leg squat seemed to elicit more muscle activation, EMG, surface EMG activation than a back squat or a stiff leg deadlift. All right, when we looked at the highest muscle, we, I didn't do the study, when they looked at the highest muscle activation for the gluteus maximus uh, during a front squat compared to a deadlift exercise, there was no difference for this muscle in a front squat or a back squat. So um, we did see that the highest activation for glute max was a front squat compared to a deadlift, but other studies found that there was no difference between a front squat and a back squat. So you do a front squat, you do a back squat, and either one of those tend to show that it might be more glute driven than a deadlift would be. It also shows that a deadlift, traditional deadlift, has more um, erector spinae activation and um, hamstring activation. But now let's look at the deadlift and compare that to the hip thrust, right? So, a, <clears throat> excuse me, a hip thrust exercise has been found to elicit a much greater uh, activation for the gluteus maximus than a deadlift and the hex bar deadlift. Lower muscle activation for the biceps femoris muscle was shown during the hip thrust when compared to a deadlift, and there was no muscle activation difference presented among the three exercises when it came to the, uh, the erector spinae muscle. So it didn't matter if you did a hex deadlift, a traditional deadlift, or a hip thrust. It was all the same on the, on the activation in the low back in this study. So Born et al. 2017 reported significantly greater muscle activation during a 45 degree hip extension. So that's the like the back extension stand, which is really primarily used as a hip extension stand. So <clears throat> they, they found significantly greater activation during a 45 degree hip extension and a Nordic hamstring exercise versus a stiff leg deadlift and a unilateral stiff leg deadlift for the biceps femoris and the semitendinosus muscles. So the hamstrings more active during the 45 degree hip extension and the Nordic hamstring exercise. And if you've ever done a Nordic hamstring exercise, you could probably agree that there's not much more that's going to work your hamstrings than that. That is a wildly challenging exercise. And I enjoy even looking at videos on YouTube to watch people do it without having to put their hands down. I'm like, that's thorough so strong. You're so strong. Greater muscle activation during the Nordic hamstring exercise and the seated leg curl for the hamstrings versus what is elicited during a stiff leg deadlift and a unilateral stiff leg deadlift in another study. The prone leg curl uh, using that, uh, it's a, the machine. So the prone leg curl machine was found to elicit a higher muscle activation for both the upper and lower sections of the biceps femoris than a stiff leg deadlift but showed no significant difference for the semitendinosus muscle. And that was Brad Schoenfeld in a study in 2015. On the other hand, McAllister in 2014 found greater biceps femoris muscle activation during the RDL than doing a prone leg curl. So uh, a little bit of disturbance in the forehead. Interesting too. There was a there was a an additional note that I found as we start to wrap this up. We, we look at some of these comparisons. The hexagon bar deadlift. So uh, I like using the hex bar. I think that a lot of people like using the hex bar. And what they found is that elicits a greater anterior thigh muscle activity, but with a reduction on the erector spinae muscle activity. And so what they're saying is that this exercise might be a, an appropriate deadlift variant for any of your athletes or any of your clients that may have low back issues. All right. So with that said, that was kind of a, a summary of the study that was done on EMG and deadlifts, deadlift variants, and comparing those to different types of other exercises. Well, some compared the variants to each other and then compared to different exercises. So I found that interesting. I thought that you may appreciate that. 
So uh, thanks for listening. Make sure you like, subscribe, share the episode, share the podcast with your friends and fitness family. And feel free to reach out to me if you want to uh, talk to me and let me know what's going on with you, that you've passed your exam, that uh, that you want to hear a topic. Just reach out to me and let me know. You can do that by hitting me up on Instagram at dr.rickritchie, or you can email me at rick.ritchie at nasm.org. Thank you so much. Keep inspiring people to fitness. I appreciate it. This has been the NASM CPT Podcast.